Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and uh, wherever you are, and welcome to this TechNet 21 webinar series on capacity development and professionalization. The session today will focus on the lessons learned in locally driven supply chain capacity development and learning. You can listen to this presentation in English, the original language, or in French, en français. Uh, to do so, please select the globe at the bottom of the Zoom window and choose the desired language. If you have any problem, just let me know in the chat and I will try to help you. I'm going to say that in French for our francophone friends. Uh, si vous souhaitez écouter cette présentation en français, utilisez le globe en bas de votre écran, interprétation, cliquez dessus et choisissez la langue française. Talking about the chat box, if you need any support, uh, you can already introduce yourselves and tell us where you are from and your name. We'd be happy to know that. Um, so don't hesitate to use the chat box for um, for support if you if you have struggle if you struggle to to hear the the presenters and so on. If you have any question during the presentation, don't hesitate and don't wait until the Q and A session. You can ask them at any time in the Q&A area, in the Q&A box. Um, it's also available at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, these questions will be answered after the presentation during the Q&A session. Finally, this session is recorded in French and in English, and we'll share with you the links to the video, as you know, uh, and uh, we'll also share the, the, the slides and potential documents that will be shared by the presenters. I hope you'll enjoy the session, and I'll give the floor to Rebecca. Rebecca, the floor is here. Thank you, Alex. And thank you all so much for joining us today for this webinar. We are incredibly pleased and thankful to be here. Um, we provided this opportunity by TechNet to, to share and, and connect with others who are interested in developing capacity to support the supply chain workforce, which is a passion of mine and something I think is incredibly important to supporting strong immunization and, and primary health systems overall. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. I'm pleased to be joined by Tina Ravalona Rivu. Tina is a supply chain advisor for Management Sciences for Health, and he works on the Impact Project, which is a USAID funded project implemented by PSI and other partners in Madagascar. He works closely with the Ministry of Health Logistics Management Unit to build capacity and coordinate and strengthen supply chain activities and players. And today, Tina will be presenting uh, something called the SPAR strategy and how it's been implemented in Madagascar. SPARS, S-P-A-R-S, is an indicator-based, multi-pronged, continuous quality improvement strategy that combines supervision, on-the-job training, and provision of tools and guidelines with structured performance reviews to identify and prioritize issues and encourage progress by rewarding performance improvements. So I'm really looking forward to Tina's presentation on that today. Um, I am the other speaker. My name is Rebecca Albin. I am a health systems manager for Village Reach, and I lead our human resources for health portfolio, which includes a lot of work related to the capacity building of supply chain professionals. I work at the global level to catalyze and implement new partnerships and new initiatives related to supply chain capacity development in our village reach core countries, which are Mozambique, Malawi, and the DRC. And today I'll be presenting about village reach's approach to supply chain professionalization overall. Um, and then I'll provide some specific examples of our work and it, its catalytic nature, um, how we're working through our partnerships um, so you can see some of our, our work. Um, and so if after hearing this webinar today, you are inspired and want to reach out and connect about any potential partnerships, I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you and any feedback you have about our approach as well. So you see the, the agenda up on the screen. We've had now some introductory remarks. And so next I will be just diving right in to talk a little bit about what is supply chain professionalization. Uh, for some context. And then we will have some specific examples that I will discuss, like I said, about Village Reach's work and, and supply chain capacity development. And then I'll pass over to Tina and we will change languages to French uh, for his presentation about the SPARS uh, strategy. 
and then we'll have plenty of time for for Q and A at the end, so we can um, hear from all of you. Next slide, please. And this is a, a build, so there's two. There we go. Uh, so before diving in, like I said, I wanted to just dig a little bit into this term of supply chain professionalization. What is this? Why do we care about it? Why are we talking about this today? Um, I think all of us know that strong, efficient immunization service delivery is dependent on strong immunization supply chains, right? And, and who runs those supply chains? It, it's people. It's nurses, it's pharmacists, it's, it's cold chain technicians, et cetera. Uh, people we, we, we all are experienced with working with, I think. Um, and we depend on them to make sure that our vaccines and essential supplies are available at the right time and in the right quantities. But in order for these uh, professionals to, to be able to manage their supplies and do it well and avoid stockouts, they need the right supply chain knowledge, they need the right training, and they need the right on-the-job support to help them grow and continue to build their skills. And, and that's really what supply chain professionalization is, is all about. Jane, can you hit spacebar? Thanks. Um, in many cases, and, and you can reflect on whether this is the case in the countries you work, but we find that nurses and, and pharmacists in particular are trained at a university or at an institute with, with training content that does not include any supply chain content as part of their core learning before they enter the workforce. So there is this often a disconnect between you know, what's happening in academia with degrees and certifications and what the actual health systems need for people to, to learn. Um, how can we expect for nurses and pharmacists to you know, effectively manage their stock if they've never really been taught how to do so in their standard court work, coursework? So what we sometimes see is that you know, folks haven't been trained to manage inventory or, or how to use an electronic LMIS to track stock levels. And as a consequence, uh, stock is poorly managed at the facility level. And we see um, you know, stockouts having that knock-on effect of, of reducing uh, quality of service delivery. So with supply chain professionalization, we attempt to identify and then fill these education gaps to make sure that supply chain professionals are set up for success and they do get the information and the support that they need throughout their careers to, to be able to maintain strong, resilient, and integrated supply chains. Next slide, please. And just for a bit more context on why we should aim to professionalize a supply chain workforce, the main goal of all of this is to create a pipe, <clears throat> excuse me, a pipeline of skilled, locally trained supply chain experts to manage the health supply chain. And that's important for a number of reasons. Um, having well-trained supply chain experts will allow us to expect, we can expect the supply chains to be run more effectively, right? Because we have um, knowledgeable, skilled uh, practitioners. And this is true for a vaccine supply chain or, or really any health commodity that is being managed. Uh, we would expect to see better database decision-making. We would expect to see less wastage in the supply chain and ultimately cost savings. Uh, by localizing our training approach and using local service providers, local universities, um, local training providers, this this reduces the reliance on external TA uh, donor funded initiatives to provide these kind of ad hoc training opportunities and, and really create something that's locally driven and sustainable in the long run. So that's another big goal of ours. Um, and most importantly, we're doing this not just to be efficient, but you know, people's lives are at stake when we're talking about vaccine availability. So, you know, ultimately we are doing this to, to save lives and that's uh, our ultimate motivator. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graphic which Village Reach created to help people visualize and see the different types of approaches, uh, different types of activities, sorry, that um, we can tackle in supply chain professionalization. And you can see here they're bucket bucketed into a few different categories. Um, it's supposed to just provide a quick picture of things that we can do at the country level to, to kind of get started on this journey to supply chain professionalization. And, you know, I suspect we have a range of different people listening to this webinar today. Um, but as you review, as I talk 
looked through this slide, I encourage each of you to, you know, start to brainstorm and think about this graphic, think about potential areas of overlap in, in your work um, and potential ways that you could contribute to in any of these different buckets that we see here. Um, just a side note that, you know, you don't have to be a quote unquote capacity development expert to, to get into supply chain professionalization. This area cuts across a lot of different spaces. Um, as I'll speak to, it, it talks through it talks to advocacy and policy change, um, obviously supply chain expertise, but uh, <clears throat> training, um, curriculum development, academia, excuse me, um, and even private sector engagement. So there, there are lots of places for all of us to get involved. And that's why the Village Reach approach to supply chain professionalization always focuses on working through partnerships because we found that really there's never one partner that can bring all of the required expertise or bring all of the right stakeholders to the table to be able to enact uh, effective sustainable change. So I'll just walk through this quickly. Um, starting on the left side, uh, the bucket around Ministry of Health and, and partner coordination. Um, so this just highlights that their professionalization does have a number of advocacy elements that focus on working with partners and the Ministry of Health in particular at the center of it all to, to create awareness and recognition, first of all, that supply chain management is a discipline of its own with a unique skill set. Um, there's a need to, to start pulling together partners and stakeholders who can kind of rally around this and, and get initiatives started in country. And ultimately, advocacy is needed to have any initiatives um, institutionalized over time, right? So if any uh, policies need to be changed, if any um, pos job positions need to be changed or, or curriculum, for example, all of these things need to be integrated into to structures and often uh, policies at the national level. So um, that's kind of the long-term systems change aspect um, where advocacy is definitely needed. Um, and just like any systems change that we do, we expect governments, uh, Ministry of Health in particular, to be at the center of those changes. So we need you know, constant engagement uh, with the Ministry of Health to make sure that, that that is taking place. The next bucket moving to the right is around pre-service training which means you know we look at the training that's available in a country before somebody enters the workforce. So the type of certificate or, or degree program that somebody would take. And we start asking questions like, is the existing curriculum meeting the needs identified by the Ministry of Health? Or are there opportunities to improve the existing curriculum uh, to include more supply chain management content, or even potentially adding a new degree program that may feel like it's missing at this point. Um, and this touches on the point I raised earlier about, you know, wanting nurses and pharmacists and other professionals to be set up for success. You know, is this curriculum setting them up for success once they enter their jobs? So if a pharmacist in a certain country we know is going to be expected to operate an LMIS, is that in, in their curriculum before they um, enter the job workforce, for example? So it's really about critically looking at current education tracks for supply chain professionals in the country and making any updates um, to the system or the curriculum to make sure that those are aligned with the workforce needs. Uh, the next bucket is around workforce support. So supporting those who are already on the job, already doing supply chain tasks every day. Um, and so we asked the question of how can we help them to fill any of skills gaps that they have? Um, are there professional development opportunities we can link them to, uh, like trainings or um, professional associations? Uh, can we create tools to help them stay motivated and retain retained in their roles? Um, and I'll speak a little bit more later on about what Village Reach is doing in each of these areas. And so all of these types of interventions lead us to this ultimate end goal of creating that pipeline of adequately and locally trained supply chain professionals to make sure that the health system has the staff that they need to, to manage an integrated, sustainable um, health supply chain. Next slide, please. And now I'll just move on to talk about a few examples of the work that Village Reach is doing in supply chain capacity development. 
And I'll start by saying that you know, we do all of this work through partnerships and with Ministry of Health alignment. So the first, <clears throat> the first example is around free service uh, curriculum development. Um, in Mozambique, we we work with a, a partner called Isiza, and we've identified a gap there that in country there was no existing bachelor's degree in health supply chains, and the government asked us to, to do about this something about this because they wanted a sustainable way to capacitate their public sector staff rather than always having to conduct you know, TA workshops and trainings to, to build supply chain capacity. They wanted something in country that would create this pipeline of, of trained staff that they could then absorb. Um, so in Mozambique, we're partnering with their National Institute of Health Sciences, which is known as ISISA in country, and kicking off a project to develop uh, their first four-year degree in health supply chain management in Mozambique. So that's something that we are really excited about. And in 2023, we look forward to seeing that curriculum finalized and, and getting that degree program launched in Mozambique. The next example is focused on the, the in-service training side. Um, and we work on that through currently through our partner, Help Logistics. Uh, they are a training provider who we've been working with to take advantage of some of their great um, internationally recognized training resources that they have. And they are providing trainings uh, both digitally and in person for free. And we are basically linking them uh, based on the needs of our in-country counterparts to ensure that you know our staff, uh, Ministry of Health staff and other supply chain professionals can take advantage of those trainings. Um, so that's taking place in our core countries and beyond. And, you know, we're really excited to to build that partnership with Help Logistics to be able to extend the reach of their trainings to more and more health professionals. Um, next, moving on to the next square, um, our partnership with IAPHL, uh, which is the International Association of Public Health Logisticians. Uh, some of you may be familiar with IAPHL. It's a, a global platform. Uh, with for public health logisticians with a really great global engagement. They have a great listserv, um, but they're also building out country chapters. And so we, Village Reach, are working with them to support the development of those chapters um, to make them bigger, to make them stronger, more sustainable. And uh, we see these country chapters as a really important platform for locally driven supply chain professional development and are keen to you know see these networks grow incorporate new members from the Ministry of Health, from private sector, and to use that as a platform to be able to tackle country-level supply chain challenges. So I won't go much into IPHL. I know I think there's a future webinar in this series about that. So I hope you tune in for that one to learn more about IAPHL. And in the last square here, uh, we I wanted to focus on our partnership with Last Mile Health and the work that we're doing in Liberia, which focuses specifically on tackling challenges faced by the community health supply chain. So looking at how to improve commodity availability specifically for community health workers and strengthen the supply chain systems so that the community level supply chain is becomes integrated with the with the overall national supply chain and the, you know, all the systems that go with that, the digital systems, the systems for estimating demand um, and the overall supply chain strategy. So linking uh, the country level with the community level is, is what we're doing there. And the capacity development that we've done is on a few different levels. Uh, at the national level, we've helped with uh, refining the, the supply chain strategy, uh, with budgeting for commodities, with demand estimation. Um, and, and at the lower levels of the system, we've done more technical training on like supply chain 101 skills, basically. Um, and part of that approach has been to create a new tier uh, in community health worker supervision. We've actually hired uh, and trained what we call county supply chain specialists who are then leading the, the local capacity develop, uh, building efforts to train local stakeholders uh, in the public sector and, and, and the community health workers themselves around commodity management. So taking a really unique uh, systems approach there. Uh, and that's, uh, in a nutshell, the work I wanted to review that Village Reach is doing. 
for the next slide, I'd like to just shift our thinking back to uh, supply chain professionalization from a global perspective. Um, and if you are seeing any synergies or, or linkages with the work that you do um, and supply chain professionalization, I wanted to share this uh, information about you know, a future opportunity to engage with supply chain professionalization through something called the PTD Hub. Um, so Village Reach and other partners are supporting people that deliver, otherwise known as PTD, to establish a new online community of practice, which will bring together local and, and global actors to foster knowledge and exchange best practices related to supply chain professionalization. So this is something that we really felt has been missing. And, you know, this is a kind of a new emerging area of work. So um, this is filling a big gap there that will allow us to, you know, exchange country experiences, uh, research, uh, case studies of, about work that's being done in this space um, so that no one would ever have to kind of start from scratch if they ever want to, to start working in this, um, in this space. Um, there's lots of existing tools and a growing body of resources that PTD is starting to curate and pull these all together, and we'll be putting them into this one great digital collaboration space. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for this. Um, this is a, a people that deliver led effort. So please stay tuned for more information from PTD about this hub and, and how you can get involved. Thanks and next slide. All right, and now I will turn the mic over to Tina to start his presentation. Over to you, Tina. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to take part in this webinar. We are going to talk about a um, theme that's very important for us, the Impact Project. It's a project that's been held by USAID. It's improving the performance of the district warehouses by SPARS approach in Madagascar. Next slide, please, Nigel. So like in any uh, developing countries, the supply chain, the health supply chain in Madagascar faces many challenges, uh, among which uh, in particular, we observed, we identified the lack of capacities, of skills, of the staff uh, uh, managing uh, the uh, where, uh, district warehouses. They don't know how to evaluate the needs and they don't really know how to adhere to the uh, order schedule. And uh, also they don't really know how to dispatch to health facilities that are served by the warehouse. So also we would like to improve the pharmaceutical practices at the level of a district in Madagascar. So Madagascar decided to apply the sparse supervision, performance evaluation and uh, between 2020 and 2022. This, uh, this allows us to um, check the impact of the sparse supervision. So, and between both figures, we, we can see there's been a um, difference over three days, three or more consecutive days. There's been improvement of the percentage of out of stock antimalarial products. Uh, uh, Tina, just a moment, please. Uh, we're having an issue with the recording. Uh, yes, you can keep going. Uh, sorry about the interruption. Okay, no problem. So, like I was saying, we were able to notice, uh, we, thanks to surveys, we were able to notice the impact of the availability of the inputs for um, malaria, for maternal health and um, infantile health after the implementation of this strategy since 2020. So what are the lessons that we learned and what are the next steps? So we have, we, we learned that the adaptative capacity against the local context 
contributed to the success of the activity of the tool and that the supervision method, the sparse supervision method, was adapted from the tool and from the existing reviewing um, mechanism that already existed. In September 2020, the minimum score that existed um, to be considered as performing category, it was raised from 80% to 90% after a few visits. And this pushed the districts to reach um, better performance. Another thing during the pandemic, the frequency of the visits had to be reduced. Um, and so we had to uh, favorize um, online coaching and the frequency of supervision visits um, is uh, not proportional to the scores um, during the last visit. And regarding um, the um, durability, uh, the, the sparse approach um, in Madagascar was already integrated in the manual of um, input management, which was validated in May 2022. The uh, training curriculum regarding input management, including um, sparse reviews, is also being finalized. This is going to be integrated to the best practices soon. And also training for regional supervisors are planned and they will be implemented in the whole of Madagascar. So this is about supervis supervisors, future regional supervisors who are in the regions that are not being supported by USAID and so who don't, do not benefit from this uh, sparse implementation. Um, Nowadays, we were able to train 98 supervisors who come from districts and regions. And so now we want to move to other regions. To conclude, the methodology based on the sparse method and the tool that was used, they, they are very practical and they are very use, easy to use. Um, in order to measure the um, where district warehouse performance, to track progress um, at any time, and also to identify um, adapted action plans um, regarding supervision and reviewing during the visits. The impact project will support the Ministry of Health in order to document these activities and to, to keep to keep rolling out this approach um, nationwide. So on this, I would like to finish my presentation and I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, I think it's time now for the questions and answers. So I will give the floor to Jane, who will moderate the questions and answers. Jane, um, do you have access to the Q&A uh, question to the Q&A box? Can you see the questions? Yes, I can. OK, Jane, so the floor is yours and I'll let you uh, distribute the questions. Uh, I'm just uh, just before we we start the, the Q&A. Please, everyone, if you have any additional question, just don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, you, you have another like 20, 24 minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you um, for those that have already put their questions in the chat. Do feel free in the question and answer um, box, do feel free to continue to put questions um, in there as they occur to you. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Jane Briggs. I work as a Senior Principal Technical Advisor at Management Sciences for Health. Um, we are one of the partners on the consortium of um, the project IMPACT that um, Tina represents um, from Madagascar. That project is led by PSI, but MSH is a, a sub on that project. Um, and I also work on other global level um, projects um, at MSH, medicines, and technologies um, from and pharmaceutical services is a big project that's being implemented by MSH and partners funded by USAID. So thank you um, for your presence today and for your interest in this subject. Um, Rebecca, I think there's a couple of questions um, for you. Um, 
I guess you also have access to the box, but I will read them out so that everybody can hear the questions. Um, so there's a question saying, while it is important to gain alignment within the Ministry of Health to support supply chain professionalization through the coordination, pre-service training and workforce support, the Civil Service Administration also has a role in recognizing supply chain positions as a profession. Please speak to any work or examples related to working with the government at large to professionalize health supply chain staff. So going beyond the Ministry of Health. Rebecca, would you like to respond to that? Thanks for the question, Barbara. Yeah, that's a great, an excellent point about, you know, there needing to be this North Star where we aim for supply chain professionals to be recognized um, generally as a separate profession. Um, and I can say, like, I can say advocacy must be a strong precursor to make this happen, but I can't say that because we've actually achieved this in any of our, our work yet. Um, we are at the stage now where our advocacy engagements are largely focused around the Ministry of Health. Um, we are, are also branching out into other departments like human resources to look at, you know, how we can align different um different, what am I saying, Pro professional credentials and academic um, capacities and, and try to make sure that there's alignment between them. But we haven't made it to, to the point where we're working with the Civil Service Administration. Our, our next steps with working with the government are embedding advocacy champions in different parts of the government. And we've started to do that this year in Mozambique and in Malawi specifically. Um, and some of our plans are longer term in, in scope. Um, I think as you and many folks know, you know, systems change takes a long time. And so to lay the groundwork and kind of plant the seeds for these bigger changes to take place, um, we're, we're supporting advocacy champions to kind of spread the, spread the gospel, as you could say, um, through the different uh, departments that need to coordinate to make these things happen. Um, we're planning things like advocacy workshops, um, learning visits potentially to Rwanda or other countries to to help other countries see how this can happen. Um, but as I said, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, the professionalization framework that PTD has laid out. I mean, advocacy is part of this like, long racetrack of, of activities to get through before you reach some of these higher level goals. And so we're kind of in the first part of that racetrack, trying to lay the groundwork for, for these changes to take place over time, uh, recognizing also that you know it takes time and it takes money to, to keep up these continued relationships in government. Um, and so we're also making plans for how we can fund that uh, over, over the long period um, and leverage some of the existing relationships that Village Reach already has uh, luckily, we have strong relationships with governments in the countries that we work. So trying to to piggyback off of those um, so that we can continue to be well placed and, and maintain, maintain these relationships as a part of our broader HRH strategy in, in the countries that we work. So thanks for the question. I can't say I can speak to how that is how can be done because we haven't done it yet, but we are definitely working toward that. Thanks. Great, thank you, Rebecca. That was a, a very detailed answer to the question and I think gives us all um, food for thought as we think about our, our own approaches in the countries where we work or the countries um, that we're supporting. I'm now going to turn the question to um, Tina. There is some more questions for you, Rebecca, but just to alternate between the two panelists. Um, so Tina, the question for you from, from Dr. Seydou Traore is, uh, what are the criteria on which you base yourself to select the 70 districts in Madagascar? Will you answer in French or in English, Tina? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the 78 districts um, are districts that are approved by USAID. And um, the impact project only intervenes in those districts um, that were selected. So. So it depends on the um, intervention field, the one that was uh, chosen as a criteria for selection. Thank you. And maybe just to add to that, um, Tina mentioned at the end of the presentation that the strategy will be to expand beyond those districts that USAID supports, so beyond the 78 districts. 
into um, a nationwide approach. So that, that is a discussion and a process that's, that's already ongoing. Um, and maybe just to continue um, with um, another question uh, for the presentation from Madagascar before we turn back to Rebecca, um, another question from the same person, Tina. How would you um, respond to insufficient, insufficient coverage in your districts? So indeed, we did notice, um, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic, that we had to, to reduce um, the supervision. But after we went back to a normal situation, then the, um, the supervision, the regional supervisions, with the help of a project, were able to start over properly. The supervision started over properly, but But in order to uh, res to respond to this um, insufficient coverage, uh, we 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 have to plan the reviews um, depending on performance, so we can optimize the existing needs. So, uh, meaning the human needs of the supervisors, but also the financial needs for um, the supervision and also the the time time constraints. So. We, we, especially uh, the planification is based on the score and also so the tragedies that have a high score they don't need um, as much supervision the structures won't be supervised that much so if we think the tragedies uh, uh, is not doing as well then we plan more supervision visits um, until the structure goes back to a performance level that we, we want to reach thank you Thank you, Tina. And maybe just to add to that answer, I think um, we as a project are supporting um, the ministry in, in building the capacity um, of the, 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 the people that are doing the supervisors, so the regional and district teams. And so that's obviously an important part of the approach. But also the use of the tool itself is, is kind of a capacity building tool. It's not just a monitoring um, assessment tool. It's really geared to on the job training and coaching um, and mentoring um, so that it allows that to happen. But as Tina says, there's, there's lots of factors that um, interact with whether monitoring can be conducted. And it's not just capacity, but also um, time and, and, and financial resources as well. But on the financial side, the, the Directorate of Pharmacy is already um, recognizing the importance of, of advocating for solid budget lines for the supervisory um, focus um, in the, in the, at the district level. Great, so thank you. Um, Rebecca, I want to turn back to you now. Um, there's a question here about um, recognizing the profile of health logisticians in public service um, and how, how can that be sort of raised as a, as a, as a profession? Um, how, how can it be considered as a, a corporation, as it says in the question? Would you like to respond to that? Great, thank you. Thank you, Claude, for the question. And thanks, Jane, for reading it. Um, yeah, I think this directly relates to the question prior uh, posed by Barbara. You know, um, this is, a, again, something that we are looking as kind of a an overall goal, a uh, long-term goal. This is something like this, you know, getting a professional association institutionalized in a country that would, that would regulate uh, and oversee a profession, uh, oversee health supply chain as a profession is is not a small ask by any government. You know, it's something that would take a lot of people's time, uh, money, you know, some people's, um, you know, it would take people to be responsible for it and, and um, to make it something that's institutionalized is a, a big ask on anybody's part. So uh, we're starting, as I said, with, with advocacy, but also I think a big potential influencer here is also the connection I made with IPHL earlier. Um, so the country chapters tackle professionalization on a couple of different angles. You know, they they build skills, um, help people to network, but also when you can involve um, key players from government and other higher level stakeholders, I think that is, and get them involved, I think that's another channel that we can use to to advocate toward this you know, recognition of supply chain as a, as a profession. If you get 
the right people on board IPHL and start using leveraging IPHL as that type of advocacy platform as well. Um, I think that can help us reach this goal a lot faster. So that's one of the reasons we're we're also uh, hyper focused on on that avenue using IPHL. Um, but completely agree that you know this is a big gap that um, needs to be filled, and and that's um, one of definitely one of our supply chain professionalization goals. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. And I think that's a, a nice reminder of the role that IAPHL plays there. And if people aren't aware of that network, um, maybe we could drop in the chat, Rebecca, I don't know if you have it to hand, we could drop in the chat the um, email to, to join up on that list, uh, because it really is a very valuable um, list uh, to be part of for receiving information about um, successful interventions um, and, and also the activities of the different chapters that Rebecca mentioned also. Um, okay, so um, I am going to turn to um, the last question in the Q&A list, which is from um, Hilaire Cavea, um, and he asked, est-il possible de nous présenter les grandes lignes de contenu de l'outil de supervision SPA? Cela nous permettra à mieux apprendre les aspects de cet outil qui ont conduit à des performances réalisées au Madagascar. Tim, je te laisse répondre à la question, mais je vais peut-être projeter le slide qui, qui montre un peu les, les différents aspects de la de l'outil. And now over to you, Tina. Okay, thank you, Jane. So like I said earlier, there are uh, six um, uh, six fields that we assess. For the six um, categories, we have questionnaires that are in the supervision tool. So for example, I can just give uh, one example. We're going to assess, um, we can, we're going to assess the, the provider, um, the stock manager of the warehouse. So do they, do they have the minimum, do they meet the minimum criteria education wise? Do they have an IT training? Um, do they know how to manage inputs? Um, do, um, are they, are they respecting the guidelines from the health service? Um, we also assess if we're still talking about the human resource category, for example, we are checking, we are assessing their knowledge of the um, input management um, on the basis of input management with questions that we will grade. We also assess um, whether the, the person received any kind of continuous training. So there are many questions, many questions on the control system of the inventory control system. We assess, we identify whether the management systems are available, if they're used. If, um, if also the, the pharmacist knows how to deal with um, stock res stock residues with um, out of date products. Um, We've also the assessment of um, stocking practices, are the conditions, the stocking conditions that are required, are they, um, are they respected? There's also, there are also assessments in terms of stocking, temperature control, and also for, for other categories, for example, governments. Um, so about governance, how do we deal with the funds? Um, are, are there some uh, accounting books? Is there any kind of traceability of the expenses? Uh, this also, is there ever any reports regarding distribution? Uh, does the FAGEDIS respect cyclical orders uh, at the central level? Uh, all of this based on verifications, on exhibits, also does the district pharmacy send the reports, send the logistic reports? Also, for example, uh, we, we check the availability of the products um, by sampling. So whether we're talking about um, medical program products or um, essential medication inputs, so these are um, a lot of questions that that are checked um, with the tools or with management tools or with exhibits in order to grade each category and and then we, we classify 
then we classify the, uh, the visited pharmacy depending on the, the grade that we received. There it is, thank you. Great, thank you, Tina, for that um, overview of the different elements of the SPARS. And, and when the team send out a, um, a summary email with the links to the recordings, we can also include some resources. There's a, a few briefs and some other peer review journal articles about this approach when it was used in Uganda with some um, very detailed um, evaluation. So we can certainly share those with you as a, as a resource. Um, I did notice that there was a question in the chat, um, Rebecca, that you may want to um, respond to. Somebody is asking um, about online trainings in supply chain. Is that something that you'd like to um, speak to, Rebecca? Sorry, I don't see the question. Is it, is it just asking, the, are it's there? In the, it's in the chat. Is how can, you, how can you get access to a training online in supply chain? Oh, uh, well, there are a lot of different supply chain uh, training providers that offer digital trainings. The one that I mentioned in our presentation was through a, an organization called Help Logistics, um, but there are many different training providers, um, some that come to mind. Uh, one, another one is the Empower School of Health has a, a huge catalog of trainings some of these are free of charge. Others are, you have to, to pay. Um, some of them are kind of pre-made trainings that you could launch and, and take in your own time, more like self-directed learning. Um, others are um, more um, facilitated learning experiences where you have access to coaching and in-person interactions um, maybe what I can do uh, also as a part of the follow-up email is to share uh, a couple of different links that provide um, that can provide information of the, about the different types of trainings that are out there. But I know a, a lot of organizations, including JSI, who I think is on the line, have developed um, online training opportunities that um, I can help facilitate access to. So there's there's a wide range, and and I can provide more information in writing, but um, I hope that's helpful. Oh, Great, it looks thanks. like someone put something in the a chat, which is a, a course finder. Ah, that's what I was going to use laptop. Perfect. Exactly. Great. Okay. Great. So there's some good resources there. Um, I saw that there was a hand raised. I'm not sure whether that was somebody that was wanting to react on that point or whether that was somebody that was wanting to ask another question. Um, Derek Sai, did you want to ask a question? I think you can take yourself off. Yeah. Hello. 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 We, we can hear. We can hear you, Derek. Yeah, okay. Um, my question is uh, during the presentation. The presenter did say that some countries lack purchase uh, procurement professionals. And I want to know if it is possible to transfer maybe countries where they have enough professionals. Some can be transferred or there could be exchange program to be sent to the countries that are lacking those professionals. Hi, Derek, this is Rebecca. I'm, I'm guessing that's a question from my presentation. Um, yeah, what I was getting at in the presentation was around, you know, the the, the different education um, structures that are in place, you know, and the different curriculum that teach professionals before they reach the workforce. Um, and you're right, in, in different countries, some are would be more prepared to have people that have had more training in procurement and others that have less training in procurement, it would be different for each country. Uh, we're not really looking at any like inter-country um, collaboration in that sense. So I haven't heard of any um, initiatives um, that are like the one that you're describing, kind of like sharing uh, professionals back and forth. Um, although, it, you know, it's an interesting idea to have in, inter-country collaboration and collaborate to standardize um, 
educational standards so that, you know, there are enough people that have procurement backgrounds and, and that the educational, um, so the, and that they're trained in similar ways, is guess what I'm saying, uh, across the continent. That could be interesting, but I haven't been involved in any initiatives that kind of shares workforce between different countries. So I don't have a lot of feedback or comments specifically around procurement specialists. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. I think um, looking at the time, we're, we're pretty much at the top of the hour. So I'm not sure, um, Alex, if you have any um, closing out um, comments or logistic information to provide. Thank you. Um, well, yes, um, just a reminder that we're going to share to, to share the, the, the links to the presentation and the recording. We had a, an issue with the recording. So we're discussing now uh, offline with uh, Fred to to see uh, how we're going to 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 manage this uh, this technical issue. But in any case, we're going to share with you all the information, and um, that's it. Uh, we have um, maybe, and this is not related to this particular session, but um, we have uh, a session on EVM that was cancelled. Uh, that was part of this webinar series and that is postponed to uh, January the 12th, same time, uh, also a Thursday. Um, you should have received an email already, so you have all the information. That's it on my side. Um, Rebecca, Jane, uh, Tina, is, would you have? Uh, would you like to, to add anything else? Nothing else for me, just to thank all the participants and, and we look forward to providing you with that follow of information um, about courses and other things in, in the email that will go out to everyone. So thanks for joining. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. It was a great experience um, to, to be able to exchange with you and with my peers. If there are any questions later, we are here to give more info. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of the panelists. This was a very interesting session. So thank, thanks for your time. Thanks to all the participants for joining. Thank you very much. So uh, we wish you all uh, an excellent end of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Merci.